One of the things uh, Gonzaga has a, a, for a long time had a number of overseas international programs. And in our master's program, we actually have a small uh, immersion project in a small village up in uh, Apennine in central uh, Italy. And our intent is to try to have people become more immersed and outside of the main uh, tourist places right. uh, to kind of get them out of that American cocoon, uh, the high level of touring they read about in tour books or, and when they're in, in big cities where they can't really right. sort of meet people exactly. But your books are always very helpful about trying to be as close to the culture as possible. And you're not down market exactly because sometimes you say, well, I splurge when I'm in Rome, I get air conditioning. Right. I do X when I'm here. So could you kind of talk about how you see this uh, value so uh, travelers are not just in a cocoon of... American experiences? Boy, that's the challenge. Um, and it's, we are um, victims of a lot of marketing in, in Europe as tourists. We're consumers and everybody wants us to consume their stuff and they're hitting us all the time with their glitter and glass. And right. you see tourists in Venice just sort of in a, <clears throat> in a trance walking from, um, walking from the Rialto Bridge over to St. Mark's and back. And they never leave that, co that shopping corridor because mm -hmm. you've got colorful English things and lots of beads and trinkets. And it's just kind of mesmerizing. And you got to physically make a point to get away from all that uh, easy tourist track and struggle and make mistakes and find yourself lost and need people and meet people. Um, you will, it's, there's two kinds of people you can meet in, as a traveler in Europe. You can meet people who are camping out where the bus lets people out to see the Vatican Museum, and they're just waiting to sell you stuff as soon as you get off the bus. Right. There's that kind of Italian. And the average American, that's the only Italian they meet. you know. Or you can get away from that, and then you find yourself, rather than part of the economy, part of the party. Ah. And that's uh, sort of a philosophical <laughs> goal in my travels. Somebody told me the name of the place where your program is. Uh, Kai. Kai, yeah. yeah. You've done a good job because I've never heard that name. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where that is. And I imagine that's a real blessing when you're trying to get people immersed in the culture. Yeah. Because then they are uh, visiting students rather than tourists. Right. And that's, yeah. a, that's a beautiful thing, yeah. yeah. Uh, last uh, winter I, I picked up, uh, actually through your marketing, I found this book is offered to educators for five dollars. Oh yeah. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll get that book. I'm really curious about yeah, the book. Uh, and it comes close to our philosophy of our program. And I thought, well, let me read what he's meaning by mm -hmm. by this. Uh, and why did you? Uh, so my question is because so far we're using it, find it very valuable, uh, but wonder what was motivating you to put this new spin on what uh, well, travel's about. Yeah, that travel as a political act is the latest sort of evolution in my teaching and. You know, when I cross the border, they say, what's your, um, what's your job? What's your occupation? I say, teacher. I still fancy myself as a teacher. And for 30 years, I've been teaching Americans how to travel smartly and thoughtfully in Europe. Now, if I follow the evolution of my teaching, and I'm, I'm an independent, self-employed kind of guy. I can teach whatever I want. Uh, you've hired me to come here tonight and give a talk. I can talk about anything I want, you know. <laughs> and uh, I just follow how my... Uh, teaching has gone where my heart has been in my teaching for the last 30 years. And, you know, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? It's right. The, the pyramid and uh, creatures, humans or animals or whatever, right. are going to take care of their bottom needs first. Food, clothing, safety. safety, roof over your head. And then you can entertain yourself and you can be creative and then you can be altruistic and fulfilled or whatever. Mm -hmm. You got that sort of evolution. And my teaching has sort of done its own traveler's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For the first decade, of my teaching, 1980s, it was all about budget travel tips. It was Europe through the back door, right. you know, how to catch the bus, how to get a good train pass, where to find a good hotel and a youth hostel, or whatever. And then in the 90s, I thought, well, that's taken care of. In the 90s, I wrote a book called Europe 101, History and Art mm -hmm. for Travelers. And my passion was trying to inspire and equip Americans to properly enjoy the history, the art, appreciate the culture, the cuisine, the wine, all that kind of stuff. So that was the 90s, and that was Europe 101. And then ever since 912, my real teaching energy has been in helping Americans gain a broader perspective through their travels. Uh, we're just 4% of this planet, and we're seeing right now this talk of exceptionalism, you know, that we are yeah. an exceptional 4%. Only if you've never been out of this country would you believe we're an exceptional 4%. <laughs> I don't want to sound unpatriotic. Yeah. I'm American through and through. But I'm smart enough to know we're not exceptional. We're, yeah. we're good, but there's other people who are good too, yeah. you see. And uh, from a Christian point of view, you know, a lot of people say, God bless America. Well, 
that is so counter to Christian basic beliefs. God created all the people on this planet, not just the Americans. And <laughs> he's not a parent that loves some kids more than others. <laughs> and maybe these kids have to get out and get to know the family a little more, you see. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's uh, the irony, the sad irony of 9-11 is it causes the people who need to travel most to be less likely to travel because of fear and because of misguided patriotism and economic self-interest, they decide to stay home, mm -hmm. be patriotic, mm -hmm. you know, stay home. Mm -hmm. uh, I would argue, be patriotic. It's good for national security for us to better understand the rest of the world. So they have a tougher time demonizing us with their propaganda, and so our propaganda has a tougher time uh, causing us to demonize the rest of the world. It's a very powerful thing in this day and age to get out and travel, and when you see so much fear rattling around in our society, it's clear to me fear is for people who don't get out very much. Your students who live and study in Italy, they're going to be less fearful after that experience rather than before that experience. And they're probably less fearful than their aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas who are thinking, oh, are you going to go over there? Didn't they just kidnap some girl? And yeah. what about the guy on the boat and all this kind of thing? Uh, you know, people got to get a grip when it comes to that. So I, I'm really sort of uh, really excited about helping inspire people not just to travel, but to travel in a way that doesn't exaggerate the gap between us and them, but creates empathy and helps us connect and, and, and understand each other better. And, and for me, the, sort of the, the conclusion of that book is the best souvenir you can bring home is a broader perspective. Good. Um, so a, a follow-up to that question is what, you know, in your book you mentioned that preparing to travel and how travel is a political act. So it sounds like your answer gets at that how travel is a political act just by going. Well, travel is a broadening act by going. By going. A by political. gaining a broader perspective, then you come home and when you engage mm -hmm. politically in society, then it becomes a political act. It's not a political act until you come back and you act as a citizen who has a, who is a citizen of the planet as well as a citizen of this country. Then it's exciting the differences can make. Mm -hmm. But my hope is that people would have the perverse kind of um, enlightened approach to voting where they step into the privacy of a voting booth and, booth and they don't vote for what's in their personal short-term financial interest, mm -hmm. but that they vote for what's in the interest of, of um, economic justice mm -hmm. and fairness mm -hmm. and people who are desperate who are going to be impacted more by this election than people who are more mm -hmm. richly blessed. That's the irony. You know, whoever yeah. Whoever wins the election doesn't really matter to me that much, but it matters to people who are struggling. Right. And uh, and I, not because I'm a saint or anything like that, but just because I've traveled and I can humanize struggles and I can have empathy with these people. Now, when I step into a booth or when I talk politics with people, I'm not advocating for me. <laughs> I'm advocating for people who are desperate. And in order to sell that to half of America, you got to spin it in a way that appeals to their fears and their greed. I hate to say. So you just got to tell people, I don't care even if you're motivated only by greed. If you know it's good for you, you don't want right. to be filthy rich in a desperately poor world. Right. And uh, you could sell it. I mean, that's reason enough to vote in the interest of economic justice. You know, last summer um, we had a, a couple in our program overseas and uh, the, the wife had a problem with health. And uh, so I took her into emergency room in the small hospital. And after x-rays and other kinds of things they did, et cetera, uh, we got done after about a half hour. I was kind of doing some translation of, of that. Um, then I asked for the bill, and they said there would there'd be no bill. Uh, no bill. And so the couple just kept, well, how can they do that? How do they do that? What is? And so this is right in the middle of our own uh, looking at health issues in right. the United States. And they just thought, how does that work? And uh, in, and in they look at us instance. and say, how can you live without that? Bro, how can you live? The, <laughs> how, yeah, exactly that kind of uh, orientation to that. Well, so, so, interesting comment about the health care, because for 25 years I've been a tour guide, and every time I take, have to take people into the emergency room or something, it's the same sort of shock. Yeah. How can you do that? Well, you know, it's covered in your taxes, and, and we've been paying taxes on our whole trip. We're paying $8 for a beer instead of $4 for a beer, and, you know, that's paying for their health care. So <laughs> you, get, you need to use the health care enjoy it. Yeah, <laughs> And gasoline has been more expensive in Europe for quite yeah. some time. Well, That's part of, in Europe, part of that? you know, I've been thinking about the fundamental differences between Europe and America because we're very similar kind of sister societies. We're wealthy, Christian, capitalist, free, illiterate, all that kind of stuff. And uh, 
passion, really care about a government by, for, and of the people. And I really believe, and I talked about this in Travel as a Political Act, mm -hmm. here in the United States, we're a government by, for, and of the people via the corporations that we own. And it's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just what the we way. decide. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense to have a government that creates a good business environment so our corporations can prosper. Europe, on the other hand, is government by, for, and of the people in spite of the corporations that they own, mm -hmm. uh, trying to create a sustainable and a just society, mm -hmm. uh, maybe at the expense of short-term economic just, uh, um, affluence. Uh, and you, a good example is I think you'd be much more likely to see a law that required you to pay for the disposal of your car when you bought it in Europe than here, right. because that's not good for business. It's just honest accounting, you see. <laughs> so these are fun issues to deal with. And, and as we grapple with pretty serious challenges here in the United States, I think it's just healthy and constructive to see how other smart, caring societies are dealing with the same problems. Because sometimes we keep butting our head up against the wall, just doing the same thing over and over again, when our friends on the other side of the Atlantic have got it figured out in a more uh, effective and pragmatic way. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Happy travels. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good.